Hey guys, Woodruff here. So we are going to finish up our cardiac section, learning about heart failure. Um, so when we're talking about heart failure, um, this is probably after dysrhythmia is my second favorite thing to teach. Um, it's a very complex disorder. Oh, I have like a little like, kind of thing, a little play thing I can do. Okay, cool. Like, if you want like an animation, sorry, I don't have ADD, I swear. Um, and so, um, you know, when we're talking about this um, disease process, like it's just very complex when it comes to like what's going on. It's a very serious problem. It's a very sad problem because the heart is in failure. But um, effectively, this is my long lecture that I'm going to break up into smaller pieces. Now, heart failure is not that big of a topic, so this won't be that long, but I'm going to break it up into kind of what is it? What are the symptoms? Um, and then what are the treatments and maybe a nursing focus? So um, let's get started and let's move off this slide so I don't constantly get distracted. Um, so I'm not going to show this video, but this Khan Academy kind of shows a lot about um, heart pumping issues and what it can look like. But let's really talk about what the problem is in heart failure. So the issue in heart failure is, is that the heart cannot push blood forward. And um, it's not that it's necessarily like moving backwards. Like if you're thinking like a clock moves one way or it moves the other way, it's just it can't move blood forward. So blood backs up and it becomes like an overload of fluid problem. And so the problem here is not that there's an issue in the fluids, uh, sorry, in the like um, in the volume of the heart. It can be, it can be that there's extra fluid on the heart, but really the it, the underlying big problem, the big so what in this is that I have a weak muscle. So um, in the last lecture, we talked about the electrical function of the heart. Um, now we're going to talk about the muscle function that the, the heart also function as a physical muscle and it has to pump to get blood moving forward. So this is like a weak muscle issue. Um, so, um, we'll talk more about some of this and stuff that's going on. Um, but you know, people that are at risk for this are going to be people that have hypertension, um, and people with coronary artery disease. And you have to think of how this makes sense. Um, my muscle is going to be weaker in my heart if it has a lot of resistance to fight against. So if you're in my class and you, you know, saw my demonstration of the funnels, let me see. Oh no, I already put them away. Um, I, the funnels, like if you're trying to push, um, you know, any sort of volume stuff against a really tiny, narrow funnel, it's going to be a lot harder. There's going to be a lot more resistance that it has to overcome. Whereas um, if you have a much more open blood vessel, like, and so if you don't have hypertension, if your blood vessels are much more relaxed, um, the part doesn't have to work so hard. There's not resistance because um, hypertension creates extra resistance or like almost like an obstruction or not, it's not a full obstruction, but it's more just creates um, extra work for the heart to have to work against. Um, in order to get that blood pumping forward out of the heart, which tires it. Then coronary artery disease, this is plaque that leads to, you know, um, you know, decreased flow of blood to the heart. If my heart doesn't have the supplies it needs, it's not going to be as strong. Um, other things that are commonly related are things like diabetes, smoking, vascular disease, metabolic syndrome, older age. Um, but I mean, anything that's going to weaken or, um, you know, hurt the heart, like heart attacks, this is a common complication after heart attacks, anything that's going to weaken the muscle of my heart, um, cause damage to the, the muscle itself. Um, there is, when you get to complex, you also learn about some uh, more complex disorders um, <laughs> around the heart um, that uh, lead to more of this pumping problem too, like stuff that can damage that muscle itself. But you don't have to go too, too crazy deep with that. Oh, Spock was talking about not going deep. Let's go deeper um, into risk factors. So let's um, do this. This is like a little activity to bring together um, which statements that we think um, would put a client at risk for heart failure. So let's go through. So this is taking, so like if you have a slide like this, this like you could sit there, let's say you had on a note card, oh, hypertension, CAD, these are the things that put a patient at risk for heart failure. Um, that's not as simple as we're going to put it on a test question. We're usually going to give you something where we give you data like this. So you have to be able to take that and then really apply it to like, how does this make sense? So let's break down each one of these and see if it would put a client at risk for heart failure. This also tests your knowledge of other things. Um, so definitely want to um, bring it together. So client is male and has an HDL of 60. So first I need to see is, is this number okay? So like when you have data like this, you want to see if it's okay. So HDLs, that's my healthy or happy cholesterol. So I want it high. Remember the H is a healthy, happy. I want it high. Um, everything we, um, those are the ones that's the only type of cholesterol that I want elevated. Um, if I remember correctly, it's supposed to be greater than 45 for men and 55 for women. Um, and so, 
yeah, that, yeah, my head's trying to tell me that I'm wrong, but I'm 99% sure that's right ish um, with a little seed of doubt always. <laughs> so, um, but um, you know, it's, it's, this is definitely above the normal limit. So um, would that, would a patient having normal cholesterol put them at risk for heart failure? No, that's a good thing. It sounds like they have good, healthy cholesterol. So that alone does not put them at risk. Um, client has a hemoglobin A1C of 7.9. So when we give you a hemoglobin A1C, and yes, you should expect a lot of diabetes on this exam because there's a lot of um, cumulative stuff that diabetes and heart, uh, not, not even heart failure, but diabetes and cardiovascular disease have. So prepare, make sure you know your diabetes stuff. Um, so a client having a hemoglobin A1C of 7.9 um, we have to think about what's normal. So um, for, it depends, I don't know if they're diabetic or not, but you know, in order to diagnose someone and for maintenance, we usually like it less than seven. So this is 7.9. So whether they're diabetic or not, this is not a good A1C. So when I'm looking at this, um, uh, what I really want to consider is that um, this patient is showing signs of poor glucose control. And so um, this would put them at risk for heart failure. Having um, elevated glucose could damage my blood vessels, which could lead to plaque problems, resistance issues, um, and other cardiovascular complications. So then clients, because uh, if you don't think too, too deep, like where you're trying to see the actual path of their sugars up and what's going to happen to their heart, just think of it this way. If someone has uncontrolled blood sugar, has diabetes, um, they're going to be more at risk for heart disease. Client's blood pressure is 115 over 79. Well, hypertension is a risk factor. So if you read this too quickly, you may sit there and be like, hmm, well, this sounds like it's right. The client's blood pressure, um, you know, client's blood pressure or hypertension is a factor. But what is their blood pressure? 115 over 79. So their blood pressure is okay. Does someone having a normal blood pressure put them at risk for heart, fail heart failure? No. So is blood pressure a factor? Yes, but only if it's elevated. So this is also um, one like the first one that would not um, put them at risk risk. Client has had a heart attack in the past. So this one, just like I mentioned, absolutely, this would put someone at risk in, um, for heart uh, failure because um, any damage to the heart, heart cell death, um, you know, think of it like having a chronic injury to one of your other muscles. Like, you know, if you like to work your biceps, work your um, quads, whatever it is, if you have an injury to that muscle tissue, it's not going to be as strong and you're not going to be able to work it the same way. Um, client states that they recently quit smoking. So there's some stuff like they say with like coronary artery disease that if you quit smoking, it like significantly decreases your risk. But when it comes to heart failure, and especially they recently quit smoking, um, any history of smoking is not going to be like, it's not that like suddenly like it's been 10 years and you're okay now. Um, no, like it still in significantly increases your risk because it does blood vessel damage, which can do damage to resistance. It can cause resistance and plaque issues in the blood vessels. Um, which can put you increased risk for heart failure. So, so far the hemoglobin A1C of 7.9, the heart attack and the smoking history all put this patient at risk. Client states, I do not um, add any additional salt to my foods. Well, that's a great thing, you know, um, not adding any additional salt's a good thing. Now, of course, if you're like me and like to overthink, um, you may sit there and say like, well, they're not adding any additional, but how much salt are they actually putting on? This is not asking that. It's just saying, it's really looking at what this statement's trying to see is if you recognize that it's a positive thing that they're not adding extra salt on top of their food. And we do not want patients to do that. So if they're not adding any additional salt, great. Um, does that mean their diet is perfect? I don't know. But in this statement alone, all I can go off is what is in this statement. And the statement says that I don't add additional salt to foods. So if they're not adding any additional salt, that's a good thing that it would um, decrease their risk for heart failure. Um, client's BMI is 32. So this will require you to know what a normal BMI is. Um, it's like 24 point five or something like that and lower is normal. Like really think 25 to 30 is um, overweight and then 30 and above is obese. So if they're at 32, um, you know, what do you call them? That is obesity, which is a risk factor. So the risk factors are going to be the elevated hemoglobin A1C, the previous heart attack, the smoking history and the BMI of 32. So the body tries to help in heart failure. And there's this really great um, simple nursing video um, and so, um, if you want to watch it, that kind of talks about how the body tries to help. And it talks about the, um, effectively the, uh, compensation system that your body does. So this is pretty much what's happened in heart failure. Let me lay it down for you. Let me get comfortable. So the, the heart is not pumping well. 
um, what do you call it? The heart is um, having difficulty having a strong enough muscle, but it's not going to go down without a fight. It's like, I've got friends and I've got other ways to make this better. So a couple um, things that happen is, and it's not even just about the heart. When, when the heart's not doing its, its thing, other organs are like, Shh, I'm not getting, I'm not hearing a lot from the heart lately. Like something's got to change. So what happens is, is that the heart is, um, when the heart's not pumping out blood forward, the kidneys, they are nosy as ever. And they are very selfish and want all the flow. And so what happens is that a patient, um, with heart failure, um, they're going to, um, uh, what do you call them? Their kidneys are going to respond by stimulating the sympathetic nervous system and the Ren angiotensin aldosterone um, system. Um, and so what this does effectively is, is the bot, the kidneys are sensing, Hey, I don't have enough flow. I'm missing something. So what happens is, is that the kidneys are like, Hey, I need more water. So they, um, stimulate the Ren and angiotensin aldosterone system. And then they also stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, um, to say, Hey, maybe the heart's having an issue here. Let me tell it to squeeze faster and let me constrict the vessels so I can like, almost like squeezing a hose to get more flow to them. So, um, it's trying to do everything. It's like, I don't know what's going on with the heart, but I'm going to get more water in this house. I'm going to get more vessels squeezed to get flow to me. And I am going to make that heart pump faster because I need more flow. So, you know, in the beginning, this actually helps because in the beginning, their heart rate goes up. Um, they have more fluid. Um, so even though their heart's not pumping well forward, they have more fluid. So, you know, sometimes they can compensate for a short period of time. They also have that um, vessel squeeze, the SVR, the resistance increases, which, you know, it might sound bad, but in the beginning, like some squeeze to the vessels is good. It helps to get things moving forward. Um, but what happens as time, when the other thing is, is that the heart also on its own, it's not going to go down without a fight. So it balks up and it gets really big and fat. But if you look at it this way, um, it's like, I mean, there's different types of heart failure. And by the way, like there's diastolic, systolic, blah, blah, blah. You like, um, you do not need to know that in depth. You just need to know we're just talking in general. Um, but like with this, like you can see how in this muscle here, the heart is so thick. Look at how small these chambers are. There's no room for fluid in these chambers. So um, we have this weak heart that is full of fluid. It can't pump blood forward. It has less space. And then it, on top of that, it has all this resistance outside. So like when the, the left ventricle here is trying to pump blood out of the aorta, um, it had no, um, it has so much resistance because of that elevated um, sympathetic nervous system and that RAS that is stimulated. So um, it gets to the point where it's like, it, it's trying, the body is trying to help itself, but it just gets worse because effectively my heart is racing fast and getting tired. I have all this fluid on board and I'm already saving more fluid because my RAS is stimulated. Um, I have resistance in my blood vessels, which makes it even harder for my heart to pump blood forward. And, um, you know, my heart is so weak. I, I just can't do anything. So I have too much fluid, hearts racing, um, narrow vessels that create more resistance. And overall, as a whole, this leads to um, a lot of pressure and a lot of difficulty. Um, so, and the, and the heart just gets weaker and weaker. So again, like the kidneys were trying to help the heart tries to do the right thing and, you know, get stronger. But at the end of the day, it leads to a lot of problems. So, um, that's all I'm going to do for this video. The next video will talk about the types of heart failure, and then we'll go into, um, signs and symptoms. I'll see you for that one.